is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in Paris, and here's what's coming up on today's program. European stocks muted as cautious investors await U.S. CPI data that may provide clues on future Fed policy decisions. Little progress in averting a first-ever U.S. default, but President Biden and Republicans pledged to continue talks on the debt limit. Plus, Bloomberg sources say Italy has signaled it will quit China's Belt and Road Investment Pact by year-end amid escalating geopolitical tensions. So good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday. I'm here in Paris ahead of J.P. Morgan's annual Global Markets Conference, just a week and a half after it took over the troubled U.S. bank First Republic. Now, tomorrow I'll sit down exclusively with J.P. Morgan Chief Executive Jamie Dimon. That's at 1.15 p.m. London time on Thursday. Now, the conversation is not only going to be about banks, but in general, we'll ask him about market sentiment and, of course, everything that's going on with the U.S. Uh, default and debt ceiling limit concerns. Now, the market's uh, pretty cautious ahead of that U.S. CPI number. That should and will give us a good indication on future Fed hikes or not. European stocks also a little bit cautious. Again, if you look at banks, the strongest performers, certainly amongst European stocks, uh, Crédit Agricole, higher following a record first quarter for the French firm's investment bank. And then, look, if you look at the inflation figures out of the U.S., they're definitely top of mind for investors. The report expected to show headline CPI rising by 5 percent in April on a year-on-year -year basis, still well above 2 percent, that level targeted by the Fed. European stocks down 3 tenths of a percent. Now, President Biden and congressional Republicans say they will hold further talks on raising the debt limit as they attempt to avert a first-ever U.S. default. Everybody in this meeting reiterated the positions they were at. I didn't see any new movement. The president said the staff should get back together. The staff will get together and we'll get back together the principals on Friday. We explicitly asked Speaker McCarthy would he take default off the table. He refused. The United States is not going to default. It never has and it never will. Well, for more, let's bring in Bloomberg's EMEA News Director, Ross Matheson. Ross, if you look at where we are right now, so no tangible progress, but they will continue talk. So what do you make of it? Well, that's right. I mean, they met for just one hour yesterday, and that was their first meeting since February. So no one was really expecting them to come out and say, yes, we've struck a deal. It's not in their interest, really, to announce a deal. Uh, yet, This, you know, when we're still some way from June, the first, but what we are seeing at least is the ability to get in a room together and have a conversation and the desire to keep talking. And we'll look for sort of further signs of meetings into next week. The question is, does that force the US president to defer or cancel his travel uh, to Asia? He's due to go to the Group of Seven summit in the middle of next week and then on to Australia and Papua New Guinea. If this is reaching a crescendo at that point or if there are signs that are getting towards a deal, does he need indeed to stay home and deal with that? Uh, and that's one thing we, we really need to look for, any indications that he's changing his travel plans. But at least we know they are willing to talk. There are some signs they're trying to find some way to compromise without giving in too much on the, on the really contentious issue, which is the spending question. Republicans want to cut spending significantly. Democrats don't want to. But can they tack other things onto a deal? that would make it amenable uh, to get this, get some sort of agreement through Congress more broadly. And that could involve perhaps uh, support for fossil fuels, for example, or agreeing to claw back some of the pandemic aid. So, so those are some of the signals we need to look so for really over the next 48 hours. Yeah, and for the moment, the market is just looking at these intensified negotiations and kind of putting some of the worries to one side. What's the incentive, Roz, of reaching a deal before June 1st? Well, there are incentives to do so and there are incentives not to do so. Of course, the biggest incentive is the damage it could do to the U.S. economy. You don't want to be president when hundreds of thousands of, of workers lose their jobs because of this. You don't want to be Republicans going into an election in 2024 having caused this. And so that's an incentive to reach a deal, obviously, as soon as June the 1st. But there's also incentives to keep it going right up to the very last minute. We are in that electoral cycle. Republicans need to be seen to be holding the line, particularly on spending. Democrats need to be seen not to be giving in to Republican demands. And so they each want to show to their base that they're the ones who are standing firm and the other side perhaps is giving the ground. And so that means we're really probably going to continue until the very last minute.
to get a deal uh, over the next couple of weeks, potentially. Even the US president said, we're in an era now of game and shit. We can expect this to continue. But really, in the end, do you want to be responsible for what would happen if they drive the US economy over the cliff? Thank you so much, Ros. As always, Bloomberg's EMEA News Director, Rosalind Matheson. Now, markets, of course, will also be watching for US CPI data later today. So let's bring in Bloomberg's Executive Editor for Markets, Paul Dobson. Paul, so run me through the thinking here. It's all about CPI. It's always been all about CPI. But could we be getting at a point where some of uh, the credit data out of the Fed is more important to try and figure out the credit crunch and what that means for the consumer than the actual CPI data? Mm. Uh, so it's a good question, isn't it? People are already starting to look ahead, aren't they, Francine, to, you know, how big a slowdown are we going to have and what is the uh, uh, central bank going to have to do about that later in the year? How deep are the cuts going to be? That's where a lot of the pricing gyrations are going on. And people may be losing sight of the fact, you know, just a second, the Fed still hasn't got inflation under control yet and it's going to still need to keep those interest rates high for as long as it dare if it's going to be able to, to tackle them and get to grips with it. So, you know, some of the biggest banks on the street have been mapping out uh, some scenarios for what the market could do today. We've been looking at uh, JP Morgan's forecast, for example. Basically, under 8% good, uh, over 8% bad seems to be their call. And extre extreme results over 8% could produce some pretty hefty amounts of volatility and some pretty sharp moves in equity markets. Partly, I think, because, you know, investors are sort of like taking their eye off the ball a little bit in terms of the CPI numbers. So, Paul, and again, if you look at indices, certainly in the U.S., they've, they've, they seem to be ranging or, you know, trading range bound in a pretty narrow range since, again, they're, they're just trying to figure out this inflation versus recession outlook. Yeah. And, and so that's the, the longer term thing is what's the new catalyst that we're going to get? I think we're all still a little bit uh, shaken from the turmoil that we've seen in the banking sector. Uh, those regional banks, you know, has that gone away? You know, the market took quite extraordinarily the uh, news that PacWest was cutting its dividend by 96 percent. Uh, as a good news sign, you know, they're getting to grips with their capital requirements, uh, they're shoring up reserves. This is a good thing. But if all of the banks are going to need to cut their dividends by that much, that can't be terribly good news for the banking system overall. And it can't, as you were saying, be very good uh, news for the, for the likelihood of the banks extending more credit to customers in the second half of the year. So looking at how fast that slowdown is going to come, you know, whether at least inflation can come down at the same time and give the Fed room for cuts. Otherwise, if we move into that stagflationary environment, which nobody wants to see, then that's some real danger and could cause much greater turbulence right across our asset classes. Yeah, and Paul, in terms of some of the market moves, so we've talked extensively about what happened to the price of oil and then T-bills. If you look at yields on Treasury bills, there are definitely surge. Is there another part of the market mm. that you think is particularly interesting? Yeah, yeah. And that's all to do with the debt ceiling, as Ros was uh, discussing earlier, you know, and whether a compromise can be reached. So we're seeing some of these short term uh, bills, those uh, for four weeks and then out to sort of the, the uh, middle of August, trading with this big premium in terms of yields because people can't hold them uh, in instances where they're worried about a default. And so that's creating this kind of um, skew in the market, this kind of uh, uneven looking curve as well, with people trying to price in those various default risks and probabilities. Now, with yields above 5.4% for early July, you know, the market has never seen interest rates on those tenor bills as high. Partly, it's a function of the fact that, you know, they haven't been around that long and Fed rates have been so low for so long as well. But also, there is that embedded risk premium. And that tells you that although at the moment, you know, it's not the sort of thing that's really moving major asset classes in a big way. It is rising up the list of worries uh, for global investors and something that they're going to have to spend time and money and effort evaluating, even if it does all work out in the end. Paul, thank you so much. Bloomberg's executive editor for markets, Paul Dobson. Now, we'll have plenty more, of course, on the markets throughout the day. Inflation Day in the U.S. Markets keeping a close eye for clues into the Fed's next decision. Here in the U.K., we also get a BOE decision tomorrow. So we'll discuss both next. And this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in Paris. Now on to the markets and billionaire investor Stan Druckenmiller says he thinks the U.S. economy is teetering on the edge of a recession 
and he predicts a hard landing. Now, amid those economic concerns, strategists are increasingly calling for stock market declines. Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs and Bank of America all see the S&P 500 ending the year at 4,000 or below. Well, joining us now is Josie Anderson, managing economist at the UK Center for Economics and Business Research. Thank you, Josie, for joining us. There is this dichotomy, this thing that we can't really quite figure out, that a lot of the predictions, certainly on the economy front, is that we see a recession, but markets are holding quite strong. Who's right, Josie? Yeah, well, it's a tough call to make because there are so many forces at play at the moment. So, yeah, in the US, we've got inflation coming out today, and that's expected to, to stop declining. We've seen this deceleration for nine consecutive months, but in today's data, we're expecting it to remain at 5%. So you've got fears, yes, that inflation will stop declining. We want it to be at 2%. Um, but then we've got the GDP grade, you know, and that was really disappointing in the latest data as well. So that's kind of another negative sign, a 1.1% annualised rate. Um, we're forecasting 0.8% GDP growth over the year as a whole in 2023 compared to 2022. So it, perhaps it could avoid a recession, but two consecutive quarters of contraction aren't outside of the realm of possibility. But overall, we think it's going to be a weak year. No, not like a really terrible year, no. but... A lot of this depends on, of course, what happens with banks. We've seen this financial sector turmoil, um, which is really worrying the Fed. And, and this, is, I think, is the big risk factor. Yes, we've got weak GDP growth. Yes, we've got possi possible um, rise in inflation, you know, certain flatlining in inflation is what's expected. Um, so there are so many forces at play. Whether or not we might see a recession this year, I think, is the big question. And it's really, really difficult to say for sure. Yeah, and Josie, I have to say, I've seen so many charts, and I'm looking at so much in the charts about credit, the labor market, that my eyes are actually a little bit square to match the charts I look at. How does the Fed look at the credit crunch? So far, they've been able to keep the banking crisis to one side and said, look, we're dealing with inflation. Is there a moment where interest rates, you know, could deal with the banking crisis and, and the credit crunch? Yeah, so it's it's a really tough question. And I think the latest meetings, notes and statements were, were quite interesting um, because the Fed at first was saying, you know, we can deal with this credit crunch. We've got to focus on inflation. But now they're saying, look, credit tightening, banks being less willing to lend is possibly having the effect of higher interest rates anyway. You know, banks are, are nervous that they've seen the difficulties in the sector at the moment, and now they're, they're less willing to lend, you know, credit tightening. Um, and, and so in a way that that is artificially kind of equivalent to increasing rates. And so now the Fed is much more hesitant, um, A, because it's seen the effects, of its higher interest rates um, on the banking sector, but B, because it doesn't want to over tighten and, and tip us further into a possible recession. Um, and so it's quite tricky. Um, we're not expecting any further rate rises from the Fed, um, partly because of this, because the credit condition, the conditions are tightening. Um, and so in a way that, that should um, have a similar impact um, to increasing interest rates anyway. Yeah. So, Josie, onto the Bank of England, I mean, inflation seven months consecutively above 10%, double digit. What does the BOE do tomorrow? So we're expecting the Bank of England to follow the Fed and the ECB as they did last week by raising by 25 basis points to 4.5%. Um, you know, of course, inflation in the UK is we're still above 10%. Um, it has to continue to take action. But similarly in the UK to the US, the question is, will they stop now? And I think the answer is possibly yes, um, you know, for similar reasons, really. Um, we are expecting inflation to come down. I think that's extremely likely for similar reasons as to why the US has already seen it decline. Uh, but wholesale energy prices falling is passed through at a slower rate to consumers in the UK. So in the next few months of inflation data, we will see it start to decelerate. Um, and so hopefully the Bank of England will then be able to say, look, inflation is coming down anyway. We don't need to continue to take so much action. And the Bank of England will similarly be concerned that if they keep on raising rates by too much, that they'll push the UK economy into negative growth rates. Um, and so, yeah, they're kind of all performing a balancing act at the moment. Yeah. But are we now in a second round effects of inflation that will be much harder? I mean, it's sticky, but also... It, it seems that maybe they've they've lost control of a lot of the narrative 
in the UK and what does that mean for a growth plan for Great Britain going forward? Yeah, so if inflation starts to rise again, you know, core inflation, I think, is a key thing to look at, because if that's rising, even though energy is bringing the, the top line rate of inflation down, that is a big concern, because that is showing that inflation might be sticky. You know, the labor market in the US and the UK still remains very tight. That's concern for workers being able to bargain for higher wages um, and then inflation remaining high, not probably not at 10%, but even if it remains at 5 or 6%, that's still much higher than the Bank of England's target. And, and they will have to continue doing something about that, even if they want to stop raising rates now because they're nervous about a recession, they're nervous about the banking sector. Um, if they don't show any control over inflation uh, because they stop raising rates, then it returns to kind of accelerationary periods. Um, then that would be a big, big concern. So the Bank of England will have to worry uh, if they see inflation start to tick up again. Josie, thank you so much for all the insight. Josie Anderson, they're managing economist at the Centre for Economics and Business Research. Now, coming up, Franz Timmermans, the European Commission Executive Vice President, that talks exclusively on the climate crisis, and he really has a pledge for finance and investors. We'll hear that interview next, and this is Bloomberg. This is the crisis that uh, tops all of them uh, because it's an existential crisis. You know, you can with AI, you can take more time. Uh, with wars, you can take different views. With economic transition, you can take also more time or do it differently. But the climate crisis doesn't give us any time. Uh, we have to desperately try and reach a situation where we don't go beyond the 1.5 degrees Celsius because otherwise we'll reach a couple of tipping points and then the situation will get completely out of control. I can feel your frustration. Why are we so slow to this? Well, I think it's, it's such a fundamental transition in a time already with so many uncertainties that the human reaction, completely understandable, is to be more careful. But we don't have the luxury to be more careful. We have to be bold. We have to step forward. We have to do it now. So what does that look like? Is it more financing? Is it private companies? Is it more regulation? Is it politicians being more enticing? It's all the above. It's all the above. It's a challenge that nobody can avoid embracing. We need to make sure investments get going much faster. We're too slow. It has to be public investment, but we're talking about trillions, so it also has to be massive private investment. But for private investment to come in, we need to give assurances that this money will not be lost, that the risks are manageable, and we can do that. Energy transition is the best example. That's going so fast, and it's a no-brainer. Investing in renewable energy is the clever thing to do. How much money do we need for the transition? Are we going to get it, and in what timeline? Well, we need trillions a year. Uh, and it's a mind-boggling number of, of uh, uh, amount of money. But at the same time, these trillions will start um, releasing profits very soon after the investment. Because the energy transition, the transition towards a circular economy, liberating ourselves of the dependency on fossil fuels, it's going to create a huge new economy. And by the way, it's also in the middle of an industrial revolution. So new technologies are coming to the table every day. It's such an exciting time. It's a scary time, but also an exciting time with all these new technologies. Well, that was Franz Timmermans, European Commission Executive Vice President, uh, talking to me exclusively about what is needed on the climate crisis at Bloomberg's Future of Finance conference here in Paris. Now, let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. And a New York jury has found Donald Trump liable for sexually assaulting and defaming writer E. Jean Carroll. Now, the court ordered the former president to pay $5 million in damages after she accused him of assaulting her in the 1990s and defaming her by calling her a liar when she wrote about it. It's the first verdict against Trump in a string of cases that threatened to erupt during next year's presidential campaign. He called the verdict a political hit job. Pakistani opposition leader Imran Khan is to appear at an anti-graft tribunal later today after his dramatic arrest sparked violent clashes across the country. Khan was taken into custody yesterday in relation to a case involving a land deal. Well, Khan's party says at least four people were killed and 20 injured in fighting with security forces.
And the U.S. has announced a $1.2 billion package to bolster Ukraine's air defenses and ammunition stocks. The aid also includes satellite imagery services and equipment integrate to integrate Western systems. Well, this after Russia's President Vladimir Putin vowed to press on and win the war during yesterday's victory day parade in Moscow. So we'll have plenty more on our top stories. We have CPI today, so we look at the markets. Also coming up, a bit of advice from a former central banker to a current one. We hear from a former MPC BOE member. He has some words of wisdom for Jay Powell. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. European stocks lower as cautious investors await U.S. CPI data that may provide clues on future Fed policy decisions. Little progress on averting a first-ever U.S. default, but President Biden and Republicans pledge to continue talks on the debt limit. Plus, Bloomberg sources say Italy has signaled it will quit China's Belt and Road Investment Pact by your end amid escalating geopolitical tensions. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in Paris. Now, the focus, of course, is on central banks. Tread carefully. That's the message for the Bank of England from Sushil Wadwani, now a former member of the central bank's MPC. He's currently a member of UK Chancellor Jeremy Hunt's Economic Advisory Council. Now, Bloomberg asked him what to expect from the Fed and the possibility of a US recession. I think the best way to interpret the rate cuts that are priced in is they're pricing in uh, some sort of event which with maybe a 20 or 30 percent chance, which then requires the Fed to move very aggressively, uh, you know, by cutting by two or 300 basis points, not just the three rate cuts that are priced in. So uh, I think, you know, one always has to recognize the limitations of one's knowledge and the possibility of there being some unknown uh, hitherto unknown accident in the U.S. financial sector, which then requires the Fed to move very aggressively, or indeed that the debt negotiations go so badly that you get meaningful fiscal tightening, which then requires the Fed to respond uh, by cutting rates meaningfully. So we shouldn't uh, discount these possibilities. Also, a recession can come very quickly. You know, think of it as a sort of wild E. Coyote moment, uh, and you're, you're suddenly in a recession, and the Fed then does respond. So uh, I wouldn't completely dismiss market pricing at this point if you think about it as being bimodal. That is mm. the most likely scenario uh, where the Fed doesn't cut, and then this tail risk scenario where the Fed has to cut a lot. A bimodal market, a very black and white outcome when it comes to things like the debt ceiling. Sushil, have you had to rethink, of course, your trading strategies? They are quant in nature. Um, they have these automated inputs. But, but have you had to rethink the models? Have you had to rethink those inputs in this type of bimodal environment? I think we, one always has to refine one's models over time. Uh, economics is not physics. And it's very important to ensure that one is responding to new information and structural changes. So, for example, in 2020, uh, we meaningfully uh, revamped our models in, in, in the light of various things going on. You know, vaccines became relevant. Uh, money supply growth was uh, at very high levels. And so we clearly did need to look uh, again at our models. Now, in this current environment, we are very aware that the latter stages of a tightening cycle are quite treacherous. And therefore, for that reason, we uh, keep portfolio risk at lower levels than normal. We've always done that. Well, that was Sushil Wadwani on UK Chancellor Jeremy Hunt's Economic Advisory Council and also Chief Investment Officer of PGM Wadwani speaking earlier. Now, former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair has also some advice for the Labour leader, Keir Starmer, ahead of the next general election. Well, he spoke in an interview with Lucy Burden. Lizzie joins us now. Lizzie, so what message did, did Blair actually give Keir Starmer? 
Well, it was really interesting to get Tony Blair on Francine because, of course, he is the most electorally successful prime minister in the UK who's still alive. And, of course, we did just have those local elections at which the new Labour leader, Keir Starmer, didn't, didn't get the double-digit poll lead uh, vote share majority that he needed, that polling experts would say he needed, to get a landslide at the next general election a la Tony Blair in 1997. So Blair's advice to Starmer is, yes, you're doing well, but you cannot afford to be complacent at this point. And he said that we can expect a pipeline of more detailed policy announcements before that election. Of course, we know that Blair is advising Starmer as he hopes to gear up for government. The other thing that I would just point out from that interview was on Brexit, because, of course, we know that Tony Blair has been openly anti-leaving the European Union. We've done that now. But he said that for the city of London, there is a risk that it loses altitude if the government doesn't work on equivalence and pay all that attention, the hangover from Brexit. So I asked him, would you advise your son, Ewan Blair, to list multiverse here in the UK capital? He didn't want to say either way, but he did say that that IPO is some way off, which is interesting for watchers of multiverse, given Ewan Blair stands to make hundreds of millions of pounds from an IPO. He's done a pretty good job of, of pulling the Labour Party back from, from where it was. I mean, remember in 2019, it was just about the worst defeat in the, the Labour Party's 120-year history. So, you know, we, we've come back a long way, and he's done an excellent job, I think, of leading the Labour Party. Um, but, <clears throat> of course, you, you can't be complacent about these things at all. You know, the polls may show him uh, in the lead. The local election results were pretty good, really. <clears throat> Very bad for the Conservatives. But you, you don't take anything for granted. So that was Tony Blair on uh, Keir Starmer. We also talked geopolitics. We asked, I asked him about the special relationship because, of course, it was pretty special when he was in Number 10 Downing Street. Uh, and more recently, Joe Biden didn't come to the UK for the coronation and he spent more time in Ireland than the UK when he was here for the Good Friday Agreement anniversary. He says that the US-UK relationship does need strengthening on a political level, but not on an institutional level. That stays strong. On China... He said that we shouldn't be decoupling, that it shouldn't be treated like the Soviet Union, because it isn't, but that the UK does need to stand up to China where necessary. Take a listen. China is a, by reason of its civilization, its population, its technology and its economy, it's, it's going to be a big world power. The question is how we live with that in a changing geopolitical 21st century, and my view, as I've always said to people, is you've got to be strong enough to deal with whatever comes out of China, but you should stay engaged with China. And so I don't agree with decoupling, and I don't agree with the notion that you treat China like the, the, the Soviet Union, because it isn't. So the former UK Prime Minister, Tony Blair there. Lizzie, thank you so much. Lizzie Burden there with the great interview of Tony Blair. Lizzie, of course, our UK correspondent. Now, Bloomberg has also learned that Italy has told the US that it intends to pull out of China's Belt and Road Initiative before the end of the year. Now, the country signed up to the Infrastructure Pact in 2019, the only G7 nation to do so. Now, for more, let's get to Bloomberg's Rome Bureau Chief, Alessandro Speciale. Alessandro, this is a great Bloomberg scoop. Why would Italy make such a move? First of all, let me be clear that no final decision was made. There have been a few high-level meetings between top Italian and top US officials. Speaker McCarthy was in Rome, met with Meloni. Finance Minister Giorgetti was in the US and met with Secretary Yellen. The mood noise, the vibes uh, were good from the Italian side. Italy signaled that it will eventually pull out of this pact, which is due to be renewed by the end of the year, but no final decision has been taken. Why would it be important? Because Italy is the only G7 country that has signed so far to China's Belt and Road Initiative. It happened under a different government with very different political leanings. And of course, it's something the U.S. are looking very closely. And also, Italy didn't get much of this, except for the embarrassment with its international peers, so to say. All right, Alessandro, I think we're having a little bit of technical difficulties, actually 100% um, he hearing you. So it happens sometimes. We'll probably get back to you 
to have more on this great Bloomberg scoop. Of course, it will have implications for the Blanc and beyond. So we'll get back to Alessandro Speciale as soon as we can. Now, a couple of other news that we're looking for. SBB erasing, SBB erasing gains, falling as much as 5.6% after the chief financial officer has sold some of the shares. So we'll get more on that also shortly in our stocks to watch. Again, the CFO, Eva Lotta Street, has sold some 36 million um, Swedish krona of shares. It, they held around 0 0.9 million shares. So look, th there's there's quite a lot going on with SBB. I don't know if we have the share price. Maybe we'll get that up for you to see exactly what it's doing right now. Coming up, Turkey holding its general election this Sunday. What's at stake for the ballot box? We're live in Istanbul next, and this is Bloomberg. Against the backdrop of a troubled economy, Turks will either extend President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's rule into a third decade or offer his main challenger the chance to steer Turkey towards a reset. The country has been in the midst of a cost of living crisis and many blame the president's unorthodox economic policies as inflation peaked above 85% last year. The Turkish central bank still cut interest rates on Erdogan's orders. Turkish lira has cratered by more than 75% against the dollar since the last election. Many foreign investors have left. Six opposition parties are banding behind Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, a left-center career civil servant who promises to bring a fresh start to the economy. Most of his career, Kılıçdaroğlu's party has failed to win at the polls, but in 2019, his party unseated incumbent mayors in large cities, including in the capital Ankara and in Istanbul. Today, they are national figures campaigning on Klitschdorov's behalf. President Erdogan, meanwhile, will look to the heartlands once again, for he is viewed as a strong leader that the country needs to guide them out of hard times. Competing platforms could not be more different. On May 14, the voters will decide. Well, that was Bloomberg's Yusuf Kamel Din reporting on Turkey. So we have plenty more, of course, on Turkey. The elections in Turkey have wide-ranging implications for the Middle East and Europe. For more, let's get straight to Bloomberg's Turkey Bureau Chief, Onur Ant. Ani, Onur, thank you for joining us. So what are exactly the implications of Turkey's domestic and foreign policies if there's a change in leadership after the election? Well, a lot depends on the outcome of Sunday's elections. Uh, on the foreign policy front, we know that Erdogan has... Uh, pursued a very assertive and increasingly in independent regional foreign policy, especially in the second half of his uh, two decades in power. Should he get re-elected, we expect to see more of the same, obviously. But in the case of an opposition win, we expect to see a reset in ties, especially with the U.S., uh, the West and the European Union. Uh, I should remind you that Erdogan's foreign policies have often been in clash with those uh, entities, especially the U.S. and the European Union uh, over the last few years, uh, and especially so on Syria and some other regional issues. So uh, if the opposition gets re-elected, we do expect a reset in a relationship with NATO uh, and with the U.S. And we do expect Turkey to put a bit of a distance between itself and Russia and possibly retire yeah. some of the uh, uh, more recent uh, Russian military hardware that it purchased from Moscow. So, Honor, what would be the impact actually of a change of leadership on the economy of Turkey and the investor sent sentiment? Well, there will be an adjustment in Turkey's economic policy after the elections, no matter who the winner is. Now, who wins will determine the scope and the pace of that adjustment. Uh, according to Bloomberg Economics, there is going to be a very swift adjustment in economic policy and the implications will be uh, significant for markets in the case of an opposition win. We expect a, a return to more orthodox monetary policy settings, uh, and that would be coupled with an untangling of the uh, web of regulations that the Turkish Central Bank has built around its markets, around uh, Turkish lira markets over the last few years. In the case of an Erdogan win, however, that adjustment will still take place, but the exact uh, uh, shape of it and the speed of it will be determined by what happens between now and, 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 and after the elections. 
Honor, thank you so much. Bloomberg's uh, Turkey Bureau Chief Honor Ant, of course, as we wait that election in Turkey. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg business flash and of course a lot going on in US politics but we start with Elon Musk saying Twitter has not signed a deal of any kind whatsoever with Tucker Carlson. The ousted Fox News host earlier boosted a video, posted a video saying he's starting a new show on the social network. Now he was fired by Fox last month after a lawsuit uncovered evidence he had insulted management colleagues and guests. Well, Musk tweeted that Carlson would be subject to the same rules and rewards of all content creators on the platform. Boeing says it's optimistic it will soon restart stalled exports of its 737 MAX jets to China. The chief executive, Dave Calhoun, says air travel is surging there and Beijing needs more planes. Now it's ended pandemic measures. Earlier, the U.S. jet maker announced an order from Ireland's Ryanair for as many as 300 of its largest 737 MAX models. Now, shares of Airbnb dropped sharply in extended trading after it gave a cautious revenue forecast. The vacation home rental company says revenue could grow 12 to 16 percent in the current quarter, its lowest pace in growth of growth on record. Now, it's warning that the number of nights booked will look unfavorable compared with a year ago when there was a surge in post-COVID demand. So that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. We'll have plenty more on business and, of course, on markets. Also, the year next chief executive, Stéphane Bougna, says protests in Paris have no material impact on the city's ability to be a financial center for Europe. Well, he spoke exclusively to Bloomberg from the sidelines of the Future of Finance Summit here in Paris. Everyone understands perfectly that in the world of yesterday, uh, London was the largest financial center of the European Union. This time is over forever, and, uh, and Europe, the single market, uh, had to develop uh, a sort of integrated network of uh, connected uh, financial centers. And Paris is one of those. So Paris is, is a strong financial center, but it is, above all, like Amsterdam, like Milan, like Dublin, a gateway, an entry mm -hmm. gate to the single market. France, in particular, is having a lot of protests, very much so in Paris. Does that take the shine off of this? I don't think it had uh, many material impact. I mean, any, all the European countries had to reform the welfare state, education, public services, and pension, and have done that over the past uh, uh, years through various uh, uh, channels and through various, uh, in various formats. France is a vibrant and sometimes vocal democracy where these type of things happen when there is a fundamental change in resource allocation. So I don't think it, it materially changed the fundamental assets of Paris, of Amsterdam, of Milan, of, of, of Dublin, because what really matters is what? The depth of the talent pool, the strength of the, and the diversity of the, of the ecosystem, the fact that you have an uh, uh, and a very unique concentration of, of, of large cap companies in the same location. I mean, these, all these fundamental assets, all these fundamental features of Paris make, make it relevant irrespective of surface uh, uh, um, noise related yeah. to, to reforms that happened everywhere in Europe. Well, that was your next Chief Executive Officer, Stéphane Bougna, speaking exclusively to Guy and Alex from the sidelines of the Future of Finance Summit here in Paris. Now, coming up, we have plenty more on the debt ceiling. Some of Wall Street's most experienced traders warned of unthinkable consequences from a default and argued that the debt limit may need to be permanently repealed. We'll have plenty more on that shortly. And this is Bloomberg. said all along, let's discuss what we need to cut, what we need to protect, what new revenue we can raise, and how to lower the deficit to put our fiscal house in order. But in the meantime, in the meantime, we need to take the threat of default off the table. Well, that was U.S. President Biden after a meeting with congressional leaders over the U.S. debt limit. But how are markets reacting to this tension? Well, let's bring in Bloomberg's Markets Today executive editor, 
Christine Aquino. Christine, when you look at the market, I mean, first of all, they seem a little bit range bound, partly because of CPI. They're waiting for that. But what the, the Fed's messaging so far has been, when do they freak out about the debt ceiling? Well, Francine, as we've seen in previous episodes of the debt ceiling drama, markets really don't freak out until it's the absolute uh, last moment for them to get a chance to freak out. I mean, we know that they are notoriously bad at pricing political risk, which this is largely being treated as such at the moment. But, you know, we are hearing from prominent uh, market figures like Bill Gross just talking about the issue. And at the very least, we are seeing kind of the sort of trades, right, that you would make in this sort of situation. I mean, Bill Gross himself, while he claims that he's not particularly worried about the issue and he calls it ridiculous in his words uh, he does say that it makes sense to go into shorter duration assets your treasury bills that kind of give you that yield advantage without exposing you to longer term risk uh, and then we also have prominent Wall Street banks like Goldman Sachs raising the alarm writing a letter to Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and really just emphasizing that the US cannot default on its debt it's going to be disastrous so we're hearing soundings of it now and I think once more markets kind of get to critical mass uh, and once it gets to that breaking point then I think that's when we'll see that very pronounced market reaction. So Christine how much volatility are you expecting in general in the next couple of weeks? Tomorrow we have BOE of course CPI in the US today we had some pretty discouraging or worrying figures out of China earlier this week. What are they going to focus on next if, if not the debt ceiling? Well, Francine, of course, as you mentioned, the, the U.S. CPI report today, very important. I, I know that traders are going to be looking out for some of the key components in there. We're expecting some increases in things like used car prices and gasoline. That's going to be very important indicators, especially because we're about to head into the summer driving season in the U.S. So that's going to be a, a good kind of indicator in terms of how consumers are going to weather these higher prices. And then, of course, the housing component as well. And, you know, I think really investors kind of keeping an eye on where it goes from here uh, in terms of the Fed's response, right? Because we've seen still why inflation and that rate has come down both on the core and headline. It stayed very, very sticky at a 5.7 to 5.5 percent range. And so this, again, I think really drives on the point that the, the first part of the Fed's job, the easy part, is done. It's getting that uh, core inflation and that headline inflation back to the 2 percent target that's going to be very tough and so far we haven't really seen much progress in that front. Christine thank you so much for all of the insight. Bloomberg Markets today editor Christina Aquino for the moment if you look at stocks certainly in Europe uh, they're seeing a little bit of pressure uh, they're sliding edging lower ahead of that U.S. CPI data. Now just a reminder JP Morgan holds their annual global markets conference right here in Paris and tomorrow We'll sit down for an exclusive interview with the bank's chief executive officer, Jamie Dimes. So don't miss that interview. We'll talk about banks. We'll talk inflation. We'll talk, of course, about the debt ceiling and everything in between. This is Bloomberg. The United States is not going to default, it never has, and it never will. Even if we do ultimately um, avoid a crisis, there's going to be some brink brinkmanship in the lead up to it, and that's going to lead to some volatility. It matters, uh, you know, to forward-looking uh, expectations of growth uh, in terms of what uh, is cut. We must discuss what we need to cut, what we need to protect, what new revenue we can raise in the meantime. We need to take the threat of default off the table. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Kriti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Struggling to avoid a first ever U.S. default. President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy don't resolve the impasse over the debt limit, but say they'll meet again on Friday. The new U.S. inflation figure may give insight into what the Fed will do with interest rates. The Consumer Price Index data is out at 8.30 New York time. Shares of the French bank Credit Agricole are surging. Its investment bank posted a record performance in the first quarter. 
Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Chrissy Gupta over in New York. And Chrissy, we've had some decent earnings stories, particularly from the banking sector and the auto suppliers today. But that's not enough to hold up sentiment, which does seem to increasingly be damaged by what's going on with the uh, debt ceiling in the U.S. It absolutely does. As we have a stalemate in Washington, Anna, we have a stalemate in markets as well, at least on the macro front. If you take a look at what futures are actually doing right now, it's a whole lot of nothing, Anna. And that's really exciting to be able to say because it's only down one tenth of one percent. Does that change, though, as we start to get more headlines coming out of Washington? Remember, President Biden and Speaker McCarthy did speak yesterday to no avail. And that, of course, is having an impact on the Treasury market more substantially than the stock market. The two-year yield starting to tick higher and higher. The inflationary risk that comes off an increase of the debt ceiling is really interesting and really complex in a arena where the Federal Reserve is looking to potentially have its last hike in the rearview mirror 405 nevertheless on the two-year yield really staying above that key four percent level let's see if it stays there though as we get the developments coming out of Washington as those yields tick higher the dollar does too but only marginally I would even call this uh, much more than one tenth of one percent of a move Anna and it really speaks to that idea that there is more going on abroad interest rate differentials really kicking in here as we have both the ECB still looking to be relatively hawkish to the Federal Reserve as well as some of the other emerging banks around the world. So there is a built in bear case for the dollar unless you are worried, of course, about uh, the debt ceiling limit and that simply getting triggered, in which case the dollar seems like a fairly good bet. The bears and the bulls really pulling uh, in either direction there. NYMEX crude, of course, is on recessionary watch. If we talk about the R word, if we're worried about some sort of dramatic drop in the economy, Anna, this is where it's going to show up. 72 handle on NYMEX crude. No red flags yet, but who knows what's to come. Yeah, I've heard different views on the on the dollar and the debt ceiling, Chrissy. Could it be anything like a haven if the source of the concern is around the United States? That's certainly a conversation we'll have uh, with guests as we carry on these conversations. Let's have a look at what we've got here in uh, Europe then, Chrissy. And a negative picture, really, for European stocks. Stocks under pressure down by two-tenths of one percent on all of the three major biggest markets here in Europe. The FTSE uh, down, the DAX down, the CAC down, all around two-tenths of one percent. As I say, we've had some earnings stories that have lifted sentiment, but not everywhere. We had some uh, disappointing numbers out of ASOS, an online retailer in the clothing space, and that's weighing on the retail sector. Other names in the retail sector then picking up on that negative vibe, and that sector down by nine-tenths of one percent, one of the worst performing uh, sectors here in Europe today. Credit Agricole very much to the upside, though. The French uh, bank up by 5.4 percent. FIC trading over at Credit Agricole up by 42 percent in the first quarter of this year. Standout performance from them, and from what they were saying, could that be sustainable into other quarters? We'll get some further analysis on that a little bit later. JD Weatherspoons, the uh, pub operator here in the UK. Now, apparently, there wasn't much drinking going on during, actually, the service of the, or the ceremony uh, around the King's coronation. But you might have noticed we've had a lot of public holidays in the UK recently, and they've all been doing pretty well in terms of uh, drawing people to the pub. And so uh, that stock goes higher on its update today. And to Critty's point there about what's going on with the euro dollar, I put um, uh, that one, 109.53. We heard from Joachim Nagel at the Bundesbank earlier on today, not known to be uh, any, anything on the Darvish side particularly. And he was certainly saying that we uh, might be nearing the end when it comes comes to rate hikes, which I guess ties in with market thinking, Critty, of a couple more rate hikes from the ECB, even if the Fed has paused. But interesting to see him giving that uh, analysis, even though he does acknowledge there is further to go in terms of interest rate hikes. Yeah, as it comes to the markets as well, it looks like markets and uh, the former the ECB officials on the same page there, Anna. That isn't necessarily something you can say is going on stateside. Also seeing a little bit of a split over in Washington between President Biden and congressional Republicans making little progress towards averting a first ever U.S. default. They did, however, agree on another meeting Friday, which would again include House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. McCarthy spoke yesterday after the meeting. Everybody in this meeting reiterated the positions they were at. I didn't see any new movement. The president said the staff should get back together, but I was very clear with the president. We have now just two weeks to go. The staff will get together and we'll get back together the principals on Friday. Jack Fitzpatrick, Bloomberg government reporter, joins us now in Washington for more. Jack, you heard it right there. Kevin McCarthy saying the clock is ticking. How much progress can even be made on this Friday meeting? They can make progress, and they even said that staff are going to be meeting, uh, they said, potentially last night or at least today. Um, there's a, almost a little bit of a disagreement as to whether they're really talking about the debt limit, though, which shows you that the, it, how, how far apart the two sides are. Uh, Republicans said we are going to meet Friday. Democrats said, yes, but we should be having these conversations about spending through the normal congressional budget 
process. Uh, we're going to have the conversation about where we might agree and disagree on spending through that lens, not actually agreeing that this is about tying that into the debt limit. Um, so it, there's there's still a lot of work to do, essentially to persuade President Biden that he needs to give some concessions and that he's not going to get a clean debt ceiling increase. Uh, so they can talk about the details of the congressional budget process, but that fundamental first step of agreeing that they need to meet in the middle on a debt ceiling bill really has not fully been reached. Uh, and until they get that agreement to at least negotiate, uh, they're, they're in a very tough spot. Good morning to you, Jack. How do you tie in the comments that we hear from, for example, senior Republicans uh, underlining that the U.S. has never defaulted on its debts and, in the words of some, will never default on its debts? How do you tie that into the standoff that we're seeing at this moment? Because the, the, the market seems nervous that we could go in that direction. Yeah, you generally hear that uh, from members, uh, even at, in, at the height of a debt limit fight, that there's not going to be a default, that they will strike a deal. They don't want to induce panic in the markets, uh, even though some level of nervousness might give Washington the, the, the uh, I guess, the pressure it needs to sincerely start negotiating. There was a bit of a difference between the tone uh, that came from Senator McConnell and Speaker McCarthy. Uh, Senator McConnell said a couple times, we're not going to default. McCarthy didn't say we are going to default, but kind of attempted to lay the blame for this late standoff on the president and said that he's done everything he can as House Speaker and he's not in charge of the, the Senate or the presidency. Uh, so that you're going to hear leaders probably say there's not going to be a default, but there's also simultaneously a fight to cast blame uh, if, if there were to be a default or if there were to be some panic in the markets as they get closer to the deadline. Yeah, Jack, a lot going on in Washington for sure. But in addition to those debt talks, we, of course, are getting inflation data coming out uh, in just over three hours, 8.30 a.m. New York time. What's the thinking in Washington around the inflationary story as Wall Street starts to talk about the recessionary story? Uh, on inflation, you know, Washington it can only accomplish so much this year in a divided government. So a lot of the inflation conversation is through the lens of a debt limit fight and through government spending and what they can do with the, the congressional budget process, even though that's a, a fairly small part, part of federal spending outside of your Social Security and Medicare. Uh, they're not talking about major legislative pushes uh, in the vein of what Democrats tried to do on the supply side with the chips bill that they did and that kind of thing. Um, but really, it has funneled its way into a fight over how much to reduce discretionary federal spending, uh, which may not be the absolute crux of the inflation issue, uh, but certainly ties into it. Uh, so there, there's sort of limited um, opportunities for lawmakers to respond and engage to the, the numbers that come out. And it's kind of turned into a political fight that really folds into this debt limit fight and government spending. Jack, thanks so much. Jack Fitzpatrick up early for us from Bloomberg Government to take us through the latest on the debt ceiling and the debates that continue there. Uh, back to the UK story and wages are rising fast and finally catching up to inflation. Pay rose 10% in the past year for those taking new jobs, crucially. Uh, this according to data that's been analysed by Bloomberg. UK economics reporter Lucy White joins us now with analysis. Lucy, and it is important to point this out, this isn't the uh, overall wage numbers from the UK economy, this is specifically around those who are changing jobs isn't it? But what does this mean for the Bank of England as it attempts to get inflation then under control? As you say, it's, it's a pretty huge number. Um, it's much bigger than the 6.3% uh, rise in median pay that we've seen across the whole economy. And it suggests that for those who are taking new jobs, and this is, you know, the wages attached to job adverts, um, the, they are, many are seeing um, wage rises that are in line with inflation. And since this is the median number, many who are perhaps even seeing wage rises that are above inflation. So as the Bank of England, you know, uh, we go into the next monetary policy meeting tomorrow, um, as the Bank of England tries to get, you know, inflation under control with this unprecedented string of rate hikes that we've seen, it perhaps m makes the case for more rate hikes mm. over the next few months. Mm. Lucy, let's connect the economics with the politics here. What does this translate to when it comes to the Conservatives' leveling up plan? It's interesting in that, you know, some of the regions where their pay is highest um, are the big cities. So it's London, Manchester, Cambridge, which is obviously um, a real biotech hotspot at the moment. 
Um, so there is a, a fair bit of rebalancing to be done if we want to see uh, real pay growth outside of those regions. But there are some early signs uh, that that is happening. It's areas such as Blackpool, Huddersfield, Birkenhead, some of these lesser known towns that have perhaps not seen quite as much attention over the last few years um, that are seeing pay rise at some of the fastest paces. And part of this is um, you know, a, a factor of the shortages that we've been seeing in the economy. So it's sectors such as education, medicine, social care um, that are really driving pay in these areas. And um, as James Reid, the chief executive of, of Reid Recruitment, pointed out to me, um, you know, if we want to future-proof the economy, we really need to be investing in uh, the tech jobs, um, the tech education in some of the more deprived areas of the UK okay. that are really going to push us forward. Lucy, thanks very much. Thanks for bringing us the analysis. Uh, Lucy White there with the uh, details of that uh, Bloomberg UK uh, jobs report. Now back to the corporate earnings stories and Credit Agricole's investment bank posted a record performance in the first quarter, beating larger rivals. The French lenders' debt traders powered a surge in revenue. I spoke with the deputy CEO Jérôme Grivet earlier. Uh, again, we've been able to capture uh, a lot of customer opportunities. We haven't been taking any additional risks. And indeed, the value at risk, for example, that we posted for this quarter was slightly decreasing as compared to the previous quarter. Uh, but definitely, our teams are able to seize opportunities uh, towards our customers and to be relevant in their commercial proposal that they are able to make to the clients. So definitely, this proves that we are able to be here towards our customer and to propose the relevant solution, be it in debt capital market or hedging products. Joining us now from Paris is Bloomberg Finance reporter Alex Rajbandari. Alex, great to have you with us. So uh, what drove this really strong performance then at Credit Agricole? And crucially, we were trying to get there in our questioning to, to whether this is sustainable. Yes, so the bank benefited from a recovery in primary debt markets early in the quarter and then on the volatility around the uncertainty um, around the trajectory of interest rates throughout the quarter. So, and clients needed to hedge that risk and turn to, to Credit Agricole for that. Um, the thing is, so it's good news for investors. Shares climbed this morning uh, with uh, that news, but it's not going to be sustainable. The executives have said that uh, they don't expect this to be repeated in the second quarter because volatility has eased and uh, clients' needs for hedging have decreased as well. But still, they did say that they expect the quarter, the, uh, performance of the fixed income trading units to be quite good and uh, in line with their budgets and uh, provisions for the year. And net income more than doubling from a year ago. Is this purely a function of just higher rates? How do you go about explaining that? So it's, um, it's a mix of different factors. Um, the first one is provisions. They fell nearly 50% from last year, but you need to bear in mind that last year they were inflated because of Russia-related charges. Um, so it's quite, it's, it's quite good news, but it's, it's because there was a, a high effect from last year. Then for net interest income, as you say, interest rates, the bank has not gained so much on interest rates so far because French retail banking is not getting the full benefit of high interest rates because of high cost of funding linked to regulated savings. However, when you look at the bank's units abroad and the international retail units, Revenues have been rising 23% over the quarter, so that's quite, that quite shows how uh, benefit, beneficial it can be for banks uh, to have higher interest rates today. Alex, thanks very much for the update. Uh, Alex Rajbandari joining us there in Paris. Coming up, Sylvia Ardania joins us, Barclays' chief European economist. We'll uh, work our way towards the CPI data out of the United States later on today and also the uh, Bank of England rate decision. That's coming up tomorrow. And tomorrow we will have an exclusive interview with the JP Morgan CEO, Jamie Dimon, live from the bank's annual global markets conference that takes place in Paris. Look for that interview at 8.15 New York time. That's tomorrow, 1.15 p.m. in London. And this is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Look, all the talk this week is likely going to be around the debt ceiling debate. We were supposed to have that meeting yesterday. We did to no avail. Another meeting coming in on Friday. Now, from the macro front, the markets look like they're in a stalemate, just the way that Washington is. But there is some movement in certain securities. And this is what brings me to uh, the chart this morning. For our radio audience, stick with me here. We are looking at a chart that goes all the way back to 2012, a 10 year chart of one month T-bill yields. Now, this is really important because as we were talking about the security considered to be one of the most risk free securities backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government, people are dumping them. Investors are getting out of it because of that fear that is starting to ramp up as we get closer and closer to that early June deadline. And now it's gotten to a point that those yields are skyrocketing even higher than they did going all the way back to the 2006-2007 global financial crisis where you did see yields skyrocket to about 5.24%. Now they're crossing even that. Really speaks again to the worry you are seeing in this market and perhaps a little bit of hedging as people really measure their exposure to the debt ceiling debate. Joining us now for a little bit more perspective, Donna L. Batalji, Bloomberg Managing Editor for Credit. Walk us through just how sustainable this trade really is. How much is the market overreacting uh, relative to the few uh, iterations we've had of this saga in the past? I think there have been quite a few voices out there over the last week that basically said that this might be one of the best buying opportunities for anyone that has a more sobering view about whether or not the U.S. will default. I think quite a few people have already said that they think that the prospect of a default is very, very slim. And so what we're looking at is this opportunity to make a ton of money on this trade, not just those securities, but you're also looking at the CDS market that has also blown out. There just seems to be a bit of a dislocation here. Mm. And, and bear in mind, this is not the first time that we've been here. We have been very close to a deadline, and but somehow they come to an agreement and everything calms down again. Yes, you feel like you've been here before and again and again, Dana. Exactly. We've certainly seen this, this movie a few times. Uh, in terms of, you mentioned the, uh, the, the CDS market, the cost of insuring against default here. And some people say, you know, that, that there's not much liquidity at, at certain tenors in this particular market and mm -hmm. also point to the fact that uh, really, even if you see these rates go a lot higher, they're still relatively low. But actually, maybe the latter of those in question now, because it, to some, in some areas, we're seeing U.S. CDS price above some emerging markets, which is quite incredible when you think this is supposed to be the definition of the risk free rate. That's exactly why for some people this is an amazing buying opportunity. When was the last time you saw U.S. CDS is this high. At the end of the day, at 180 or whatever it is that the contracts are trading at right now, that is an amazing price for a country like the U.S. At the end of the day, as we know, there's a massive chance that they will come to an ag agreement. Those contracts will become a lot more palatable. People will make a ton of money. I think by you know the first few days of June, this story will die down, and then we will move on. Well, let us see. Let us see. Yeah, we spoke to some guests yesterday who actually had some quite high percentage chances attached to the threat of default. So we'll see what comes to pass. But Dana, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Bloomberg's Dana Elbertaji joining us there with the latest on credit markets. For more market analysis, check out MLIV Go on the Bloomberg terminal. That's where you'll find the markets live blog. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. A surprise move in China, a little-known local government official has been named the top regulator overseeing the $61 trillion financial sector. Former banker Li Yunzi will be party secretary of the newly formed National Financial Supervision and Management Bureau. The agency regulates thousands of banks, insurers, and trust firms. Bloomberg's learned New York Republican Congressman George Santos has been indicted on federal charges. He had been under investigation over possible campaign finance violations. Santos took office despite fabricating much of what he had claimed about his education and career. 
Former President Trump plans to appeal after a jury in New York found him liable for sexually assaulting a woman and then defaming her. It's the first verdict against him in a string of legal cases that threatened to erupt during the presidential campaign. The jury also ordered the former president to pay the woman, E. Jean Carroll, $5 million in damages. Jurors stopped short of finding him liable for rape. And Tucker Carlson will start a show on Twitter after being fired by Fox News. In a video posted on the social media platform, Carlson said he would be out with a new version of the show he'd done on Fox starting soon. Carlson was fired last month after Fox settled a defamation suit with Dominion Voting Systems for more than $787 million. Very interesting ahead of the political cycle, Anna. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, coming up on the program, we'll get back to the macro themes, though. Sylvia Ardania joins us, Barclays' chief European economist. Uh, we will talk about US CPI. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Struggling to avoid a first-ever U.S. default, President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy don't resolve the impasse over the debt limit. They say they'll meet again Friday. The new U.S. inflation figure may give insight on what the Federal Reserve will do next with interest rates. The Consumer Price Index out at 8.30 a.m. New York time. And across the Atlantic, shares of French bank Credit Agricole are surging. Its investment bank posted a record performance in the first quarter. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Anna, you know, we're talking about all these macro stories, all these stalemates in Washington. I think often the market forgets underneath the hood, record performance from companies on both sides of the Atlantic are still very much in play. Yeah, absolutely. We've uh, we've seen some decent performance, certainly coming through from the banking sector here in Europe. Critty, that plays in. But overall, European equity markets are under pressure, maybe off earlier lows, but down by two tenths of one percent as we wait for that CPI data out from the U.S. later that you mentioned in the headlines. Credit Agricole is one of those businesses where we've seen uh, the numbers uh, delighting investors, if you like, up by five point eight percent. A bit diff difficult for analysts to compare with last time due to some changes in accounting rules. But in terms of the numbers, the FIT performance, a forty-two percent increase in revenue from that part of their business, certainly going down well with the investment community. J.D. Weatherspoons, then, this is a pub business in the UK, up by 4.9% today. Uh, they have talked positively about the degree to which uh, Brits are perhaps making the most of all of the bank holidays, all of the public holidays we get through the month of May, and that's been going pretty well, of course, for a pub operating business. Uh, the euro is at 109.55, pretty unmoved this morning. It's been caught in that range of around 109, 110 for quite some time, Critty. But interesting to think that we heard from uh, Joachim Nagel today uh, giving us the sort of party line that the, uh, uh, the, the, the still more hiking to come. And that's what we heard from the ECB last week. They're not on pause. So we are still expected. And Christine Lagarde reiterating that today as well. But he did also suggest that maybe we are getting closer to, to, to where they need to be in terms of restrictive territory, uh, suggesting that there's not so much further for the ECB to go in terms of hiking rates, Critty. Yeah, and something that the market is very much pricing in. You're not seeing the same divide uh, that you are seeing perhaps stateside, especially when it comes to the read through, Anna, that you're seeing in something like yield and the dollar, which brings me right to today's market action. The two-year yield at 404 right now, sustainably above that 4% level, but again, kind of at the whim of not just the debt ceiling debates, but the Federal Reserve and arguably what the ECB does across the Atlantic. It's certainly a dynamic, to your point, Anna, that's affecting the dollar as, of course, euro dollar stays uh, stagnant as well, about unchanged on the Bloomberg dollar index right now. And unchanged in a range, those are the terms I would use to describe the S&P 500 as well. Futures only down one-tenth of 1% 1 in a stalemate similar to the congressional situation in Washington. Even as we are on inflationary watch, those CPI numbers coming out in about three hours or so, and recessionary watch. NYMEX crude still our gauge for that trading at about a 72 handle. So on the macro front, it does seem a little kind of frozen in time, Anna. But look, there is movement underneath the hood, especially when it comes to those debt ceiling talks. This is a really big part of the story, simply about how the market participants are really positioning for that, specifically hedging for that. Now, here's a chart that I'm going to show you for our radio audience. Stick with me. We're basically looking at credit default swap prices, essentially how much it costs to insure against the default of the United States government. We're going to a chart all the way back to 2008. We know we've had several reiterations of this debt ceiling debate and several spikes in those costs to insure to kind of match that. But no spike as large as this one that really crosses over 150 basis points when you look at the swap price. This is really important because on the surface, it looks like this is a massive move. But keep in mind, the one-year CDS market for the U.S. debt is not as liquid and certainly not as big as it used to be in those previous iterations. So even though on the chart it looks like a magnified move, Anna, perhaps not so much underneath the hood. 
Mm, yeah, really interesting. The debt ceiling certainly does dominate the conversation. It continues that conversation as investors await a key U.S. inflation report for insights on the path of the Federal Reserve's rate hikes. Uh, joining us now is Sylvia Ardaniet, Barclays Chief European Economist. And Sylvia, there's a lot to talk about this morning. We'll get to the Bank of England, which of course is due to give its uh, rate decision uh, shortly. Well, that comes on Thursday. We'll get to that part of the conversation shortly. Let me start, though, with the U.S. CPI picture, because of course, global fights against inflation is still very topical and uh, the U.S. piece of data is due out today. What's going to matter to you when you watch this, uh, this really crucial bit of U.S. data drop? Good morning, Anna. Well, three things, have, three parts of the report will obviously matter to us. We have the headline numbers, and here we expect an increase on the month-on-month -month by 0.38, which leaves the annual uh, level of inflation at 5%. It is the core print, which we think it will be just a touchdown relative to what it was a month before. We expect on the monthly increase 0.34 with a 5.5% year-on-year rate. But most importantly, it is the composition behind the core print. And here, what we think, what we expect is that we will see some slowing the service costs, but that will be partial, it will be offset by higher goods prices. And the higher goods prices is particularly related to the price of used cars. But I think what's important to, to see is uh, some, you know, uh, evidence of some deceleration in inflation in the service components. And we expect that to happen in uh, many different categories from transport of services to, um, you know, the, the, the shelter component will be important that we think it will be a bit more, you know, uh, resilient. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the shelter part. Good morning, Sylvia. Uh, I want to ask you about how quickly that deceleration is really going to catch up to perhaps the commodities driven inflation that we've seen in the last year or so come down. Why is shelter taking slow so long to decelerate? Well, that's that's a good question. We see some evidence in the private data where we see, uh, you know, some uh, in in Brent, we we start seeing some deceleration. It's coming, you know, with some delay in the BLS um, data, uh, which looks at the average, not just the new uh, rents. So we expect some of that to beginning to appear, you know, this month or or you know in the next um, couple of months going. Uh, but then we expect, you know, in other categories, you know, a faster deceleration. I think it has a lot to do also with demand and with the fact that the U.S. economy uh, is uh, slowing, but is uh, remaining still quite resilient. We have seen a pretty strong GDP print in terms of domestic demand components. The labor market remains pretty strong. So there is, uh, you know, that the economy is still uh, doing quite well. And that gives uh, uh, pricing power to, um, uh, to firms, to, to households who rent apartments and so on. Uh, Sylvia, I want to get your thoughts on the Bank of England. And let's just listen to an earlier conversation on Bloomberg Television where we spoke to Sushil uh, Wadwani of PGM Wadwani. And he, he advises the current Chancellor, formerly worked at the Bank of England. Let's listen to how he's approaching tomorrow's decision from the BOE. You don't want this fast headline inflation to become entrenched in expectations. So that, I think, explains why the Bank of England has, has been tightening meaningfully. We are now again at a very tricky point in the interest rate tightening cycle because we clearly also uh, wish to avoid over tightening. Uh, the consensus expects a 25 beep hike this week. Uh, that seems about right. But I think from here on, they do need to tread carefully. So Shil Wadwani there. So he says, Sylvia, then that from here on, after the 25, they need to tread carefully. What does treading carefully look like for the Bank of England? We also have an additional 25 basis points hike after this week one. So we think that the bank rate terminal will be 475. But uh, we think that in terms of communications, the bank will keep its options open, which uh, means that they will not commit to any additional hike. They will look at the data. Potentially, there is the risk that they could skip the June meeting and hike in August. So I think the my interpretations of Credit Carefully is really to, um, you know, acknowledge the fact that uh, quite a significant amount of tightening has been done since the cycle began. Rates 
states are in restrictive territory and we know that monetary policy acts with lags. So potentially um, the real effect of these hikes is still uh, to come. And, and so for this reason, the Bank of England will remain uh, you know, quite, quite open-minded and will try to trade off the two, uh, the risk that, that was basically said that this increase in prices can be entrenched in expectations versus the risk of over-tightening and, and generating a, to, um, an excessive slowdown in economic activity. And, and a decline in inflation below targets at the relevant policy horizons, which is, you know, two, three years down the road. So, Sylvia, square that then with what we're hearing out of the ECB and arguably the Federal Reserve as well. As the Federal Reserve talks about perhaps not hiking at all or hiking more over the summer, the ECB, uh, as Anna pointed out earlier, making it quite clear that their last hikes might just happen this summer as well. Will the BOE continue to hike into the end of the year? Is that idea of coming to the end of the rate tightening cycle limited to the U.S. and the ECB alone? No, in our own baseline, we also think that the BOE will come to the end of the tightening cycle before the summer. We have uh, the last rate hike as a baseline case happening in June. We see the risk of that being postponed to August. So the idea that there can be a hike in when the, the bank releases the monetary policy reports is something that we don't rule it out. But again, uh, we would think that the Bank of England will join the Fed and the ECB and end the, the tightening cycle cycled by the summer. Sylvia, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Sylvia Ardania of Barclays talking us through expectations around US CPI and the Bank of England. Coming up on the programme, back to earnings stories. Disney is out with results after the bell this uh, today. More on what to expect from the entertainment giant next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, an interview with Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky. That's at 1.30 p.m. New York time, 6.30 p.m. London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Preeti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. A critical earnings report coming after the bell today for Disney CEO Bob Iger. It's the first full quarter since his return in November. Joining us now to discuss is Geetha Ranganathan, Bloomberg Intelligence U.S. media analyst who was kind enough to wake up early for what's going to be a pretty important day uh, for, for both you and for Disney alike. Geetha, walk us through the significance of Bob Iger's impact in the first quarter here. What kind of difference could he make? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Kriti and Anna, for having me. So I think it's all about cost cutting. Uh, that's really what it's come down to, because the buzzword right now in the media industry is really all about streaming profitability. And remember, when Bob Iger came back to the company last November, he really outlined his strategy. I mean, there is a lot of uh, realignment in terms of uh, creative uh, prowess. There is a lot of financial realignment. But, but, but obviously, the biggest announcement that he made was this $5.5 billion in cost cutting uh, and it's, uh, you know, and I think what we're really looking to see is have they made significant progress on that front? Because he kind of came out with all guns, uh, all guns blazing. He had his whole strategic vision kind of outlined. Now we have to see whether he's really been able to execute. Well, it's interesting that you talk about cost cutting specifically and perhaps jobs that are on the line. As at the same time, Disney is also dealing with its own fight in Florida uh, with Governor Ron DeSantis at the moment. Walk us through how that might reflect into their earnings story. Yeah, so that uh, is a lot of headline risk, and I think that is going to be an extended battle, but it's really more, you know, about the politics of it. I don't necessarily see any of that kind of affecting the bottom line, and we think this is going to be really an extended battle, maybe going out for the next two to three years, and it, it, I don't think it necessarily gets into any kind of legal settlement. I think it's all just going to be more uh, political. But as far as we see the parks business, the parks is really turning out to be the crown jewel of the Disney empire. So believe it or not, this year, parks will be responsible for 75% of profits for the entire company. And they've really been punching above their weight. So uh, 
this whole post-pandemic new normal for the parks uh, has just been phenomenal. I mean, if we look at it in terms of profitability, if we look at it in terms of per capita spending, margins, uh, they have really been going gangbusters. And this whole talk about, you know, a, a slowing in consumer spending or, you know, a, the possibility of a recession, somehow we are just not seeing that in the numbers. So again, when they report today, we're expecting about $2.1 billion in operating income for the parks. That's over a 20% increase in profits. So parks doing really, mm. really well. Yeah, some real incredible resilience in some of those resen uh, revenge consumption activities, Geetha, uh, post the pandemic, I suppose. And you talk about lower streaming losses and how that's going to be a real focus for the markets. For businesses such as Disney, Geetha, how do they go about getting to those lower losses around streaming? What, what are the levers that they pull? Yeah, so, you know, thankfully now the, you know, the whole media ecosystem as well as Disney has kind of uh, shied away from, you know, going after subscribers at all costs. I mean, they were doing that for the longest period of time. They've ramped up about 160 million subscribers, but now it's all about cost rationalization. So there's $3 billion in content costs that they're looking to trim. Uh, there's $2.5 billion in non-content costs. Uh, and remember, Disney is a company that lost $4 billion in its streaming business just last year, but they are looking to kind of trim that pretty significantly uh, going forward. So this period, we're actually looking... So, la so last quarter, they actually lost a billion dollars in their streaming business. They're planning to... Those, those losses should moderate to about $850 million this quarter. And then we are going to look for signs in, you know, uh, those those uh, losses getting better and better. And remember, not only are they undertaking content cost rationalization, but we're also seeing them do a lot of things to boost the top line. So whether it's implementing price increases, whether it's having a new Disney Plus advertising tier. So a combination of those two, I think, will definitely lead to an inflection in the profitability curve uh, later this year. Mm, yeah, tiering of, uh, of pricing strategies and the resilience of their pricing power, really interesting to watch. Geetha, what about other brands, ESPN, Hulu, uh, uh, these areas of, of business? Yeah, so those are really the two big question marks, Anna, ESPN and Hulu. What is the strategic direction for those two assets? So we know with Hulu, um, you know, it, it's kind of uh, two thirds owned by Disney, one third owned by Comcast. They do have this all important date, Jan of 2024, when they need to kind of make a decision whether they're going to keep the asset or they're going to, you know, sell it to Comcast. So we, we still are, it's... What Bob Iger has said uh, has kind of raised more questions than answers. So he's kind of said that all options are on the table. So again, I think that is going to come up in the earnings call today. We have to see what they're deciding to do with that asset. And then ESPN, you bring up a really interesting point because this is the first time that they're going to be actually breaking ESPN into its own segment. Remember, this was the crown jewel in the Disney portfolio, but obviously with all the cord cutting with all of the you know secular declines in the TV ecosystem. Again, we're kind of looking for some strategic direction here. Again, this is an important asset. It generates about $4 billion in profits every year, but they have to be really careful about the messaging. Okay, so if they're going to go deeper into, uh, you know, a direct-to-consumer solution, it has to be incremental, not cannibalistic. So again, we're looking to see what exactly they're planning to do with this asset going forward. A lot of balls in the air, of course, as Disney juggles uh, their earnings narrative after the bell today. Geetha Ranganathan of Bloomberg Intelligence, we thank you as always. As we wait those earnings after the bell, a quick check on those shares, though. They are higher by about one-tenth of one percent, though. And on the surface, it doesn't look very significant. But in a background where the rest of the market is trading lower on both sides of the Atlantic, that is actually a positive result, something we're going to keep an eye on throughout the day as, of course, we wait for the earnings after the bell. Some other stocks that we're watching, of course, Airbnb at the top of that list as well. Those shares down about 13% in the pre-market. They're talking about cracks in their travel demand. The outlook that a lot of companies are saying is still positive. The consumer is still spending. Well, Airbnb does not share that message and really getting punished for it in the pre-market. They're down about 13%. The other stock we want to watch, Occidental, buying back 6.5% of Warren Buffett's preferred stock. Remember the story that Warren Buffett not only helped financed the Anadarko deal a couple of years ago, but he's been kind of buying more and more shares. Uh, some speculation over the weekend that he was going to try to take over Occidental in some capacity. Anna, he said, no, we're not going to do that. But Occidental uh, is redeeming those preferred stock and in doing so, losing a little bit of cash in the process. Those shares down about 1.6% as a result, Anna. Yeah, that would... That was something we learned at the weekend, wasn't it, from the uh, Berkshire Hathaway meetings that took place. Now, Chrissy, coming up on the programme, the latest read on US inflation is out in just a few hours' time. We'll take a look at what markets are expecting next. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Anna Edwards in London. The U.S. CPI print due today at 8.30 a.m. New York time, just under three hours. Joining us now for a preview is Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent. Waking up early for us. Look, uh, this forecast, we're expecting inflation to come down. It's kind of a foregone conclusion. Does the Fed care about today's numbers? Uh, not so much because there's another CPI report coming up by uh, the end. By the time they get uh, to their next meeting on June 14th, we also get a PCE index uh, inflation report before that as well. But we are expecting some news today that might disappoint the markets who do react to everything right away. And that's because inflation is forecast to come in uh, basically unchanged on the month. We're going to see no change at all in the headline number. Uh, we've got some... Uh, energy price issues there and then the core uh, just over the last 24 hours has been revised up to a four tenths uh, change for the month which keeps the uh, month over month uh, only a tenth lower so we're still well above the level that uh, the fed is looking for of course that two percent target Yes, and so that, to the point, Mike, about whether the Fed cares, I mean, you mentioned that there's more data to come, so they'll get another chance to sort of look at the inflation picture before they have to make any more decisions about rates. But also, as Ven Rahm on the Markets Live blog points out to me this morning, we've had nine months of headline slowing. So I suppose they take comfort from that trend, almost regardless of what today's data shows. Is that, is that the feeling? Well, that is the feeling, and they knew that this would be, as they put it, uh, kind of volatile, that you would have months where things don't go exactly as they planned, but in general, inflation's coming down. Uh, the Cleveland Fed CPI now indicator has uh, always kind of forecast what's going to happen, and it does show a sort of flattening out of inflation over the last couple of months. Uh, looks like, um, you know, we're going to be stuck in the fives for a while. But what they're counting on is that we're finally going to see some rent reductions start to come through, maybe in the May numbers that we get uh, in June. And that will start us on the process down to the next level, which is closer to 4%. Mike, 30 seconds here. The rent levels you mentioned, the shelter costs. Why are the shelter costs decelerating faster, given that we are now entering or ending the rate tightening cycle? Shouldn't we see a bigger effect? Well, we saw the effect at the beginning of uh, this whole cycle because rents were going up a lot and it takes a while about a year for the declines to start to get into the overall numbers and we saw declines starting to come during the pandemic and now they're uh, sort of flattening out to going up again but we should see the declines that were a year ago in rents show up uh, fairly soon. Yeah, Mike, thanks very much. Really interesting uh, conversation there ahead of the CPI data, Bloomberg's Michael McKee. Interesting, our guest from Barclays earlier on, Chrissy, was talking about core composition being really in focus, slowing services, but good price going higher. That was her assessment of what the core would show, and that would be, of course, in contrast to what we'd seen in previous months where we'd seen goods prices uh, coming down and services being uh, sticky. So a lot to focus on when it comes to the composition of these numbers. That is it for early edition. Surveillance is ahead. They'll be speaking to Peter Oppenheimer of Goldman Sachs, getting views on the equity markets, no doubt. Uh, we'll have plenty more in the run-up to the CPI print later. This is Bloomberg.